Hey guys, you're watching the Lit Sports Online NFL Draft Preview Special, and what we want to do with this episode is focus on the top prospects as reported by Scout Inc. On, and ESPN. We want to focus on those guys. They're all guys that are expected to go in the first round, or at least have a first round grade on them. I also want to take some time to give you a couple sleepers as well, and our hot takes on the draft, and uh, let's get right into it with the top offensive prospects. Gerald, who's the first one? Yeah. First up, we got Leonard Fournette from LSU, running back. Second, we have O.J. Howard, tight end from Alabama. Next, we got Christian McCaffrey, running back for Stanford. Fourth is Mike Williams, wide receiver from Clemson. Then we have David Njoku, from, a tight end from Miami. Forrest Lamp, the top guard uh, from Western Kentucky at number six. We have Dalvin Cook, another running back from Florida State. Then we have, at number eight, John Ross, wide receiver from Washington. He makes, other, he makes other fast guys look not fast. <laughs> we have Corey Davis next up, wide receiver from Western Michigan. At number 10, we got the top offensive tackle for the draft, Garrett Bowles from Utah. Boo! Next up, we have Mitch Trubisky, from quarterback from North Carolina. And rounding out our top 12 for offense, Deshaun Watson, quarterback from Clemson. That's I, your blog post, I'm surprised you have him on this list. Who I, of course, wrote that article on saying he's going to be the biggest bucks of the draft. But, all right. This we're going to discuss. We're going to discuss. This is our top 12. We, we're going to do top 10, but we wanted to get the 12 so we get some mm, quarterbacks in the mix. Um, so, first of all, let's just let the audience know that just because we have the list this way doesn't mean this is the way the guys are getting drafted. I mean, right. we're, these quarterbacks are at the bottom, but they're probably going to go fairly high. So this is just what the scouts think are the best talents. Um, it doesn't mean they're getting it drafted in the exact order. I will say I am impressed that there are one, two, count them, three running backs, top ten running backs. I mean, that, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it is a loaded draft yeah. class for running backs, but I, I do think it's kind of interesting that they put Leonard Fournette as their like unquestioned number one prospect. I mean, I think that... There's a couple guys that are in the mix for that mm -hmm. conversation yeah. as the best running back. Uh, you know, a lot of people are high on Dalvin Cook. Oh, yeah, I was about to say him. I mean, I think Dalvin Cook could definitely go. Yeah, I mean, I really like Joe Mixon, who's not even on this top 12 list. I think he even makes a case mm -hmm. for being one of the first running backs off the board. And there's Christian McCaffrey, who probably has one of the higher floors out of all these guys. Because yeah. you think, at worst-case scenario, this guy's like the next Danny Woodhead, right? Yeah, I mean, I think McCaffrey can do it all. He can get rushing yards. He can get... Receiver as heck, he could probably even throw the ball. Who knows? But so it's gonna be interesting to see where this guy comes from. He's definitely a multiple threat. He's definitely gonna be, I would say, more valid, more valuable than Leonard Fournette because of how versatile he's gonna be as a player, just as a pure athlete out there. Well, that's the big thing. And I think if you're gonna justify taking a running back in the first round, you want a guy that can do it all. Yeah. You want a guy that is effective in the not just rushing, being a between the tackles grinder, but also being in the receiving game, being a right. pass block. You really want it all if you're going to spend that first round pick on a running. I back. mean, so many so many NFL offenses are around the running back pass game. I mean, think of the Ravens, the check down that Joe Flacco does. I mean, to his running backs over the years. I mean, Ray Rice had so many receiving yards just because of the mere check downs he did. That you know that safety blanket is needed for quarterbacks in the NFL today, especially the way they're, how fast-paced they are, you know, running out of shotgun. It's great to get a running back and get out the flat and get at least about six, seven yards. Yeah. So when I look at McCaffrey, I'm looking at his floor, probably the next Danny Woodhead, mm -hmm. his ceiling, maybe the next Brian Westbrook. I mean, this is a guy that really can seem to do it all. So I don't blame anyone yeah. for taking him in the first round. Um, what else is there? Anything else about this list that is interesting Sounds to you? Anything the rankings look kind of screwy from your perspective? Yeah, man. Let's talk about the Golden Boys. On the list. let's talk about the quarterback, especially Deshaun Watson, who you recently wrote an article about on our lit2.wordpress.com website. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't checked out that article, basically my rationale behind it is. Watson was an excellent college quarterback, and we've seen plenty of excellent mm -hmm. college quarterbacks. I mean, there's guys like Tim Tebow, Johnny Manziel, that completely lit it up in the college, but then went on to have less than stellar NFL careers. And my rationale behind Deshaun Watson not translating to the NFL level is he does not put enough velocity on his throws. You know, I compare him to even weak-armed quarterbacks, guys that throw the ball like Tyrod Taylor threw the ball 50 miles per hour. That's like the minimum velocity you need in your throws to be decent or good at the NFL level. And he's got it. He's throwing it 45 miles an hour. I just don't think it's enough to make 
good, deep, and intermediate pass at the NFL level. So I think whoever takes Deshaun Watson is going to be really surprised when they find out they drafted a bust. I don't think he's going to be com- a complete bust. I mean, you can work a system around him, run an option offense. You can do a lot of things to help the kid out. I mean, he doesn't have to throw like Tom Brady or Peyton Manning to be a great quarterback. I mean, let's look at a couple of quarterbacks. Russell Wilson, for example, he doesn't have the strongest arm. Kid's a Super Bowl winning quarterback. Drew Brees doesn't have probably the strongest golden arm in the NFL. Another Super Bowl quarterback, guaranteed Hall of Famer in years down the road. Well, I give your point on that, and obviously you can have guys with less than stellar arms like Dak Prescott. What did he do his rookie year? He had a lot of talent around him, threw a lot of intermediate uh, uh, crossing routes and did really well, not pushing the ball to the field down, down the field that often. But the thing about it is my thesis behind this is that your baseline to be an NFL quarterback needs to be 50 miles per hour on the ball. If you can't get up to that threshold, I don't think you're going to make it at the next level. So that's my uh, prediction on that, and we'll see what happens. But going to some of these other guys, I mean, and you mentioned Mitch Trubisky, there's other quarterbacks in this draft. It's not really considered a strong quarterback draft class. Why these guys are at the bottom of the list? I actually think Patrick Mahomes is going to end up being the best quarterback. He's from Texas Tech, not on the top 12 list. But... A lot of people are knocking him because of either footwork or because of the um, system he played in college. It's yeah. more of an air raid offense, uh, did not play in a pro style, but you know, my answer to that is look at Marcus Mariota. He's ascending to be one of the league's top quarterbacks, and he was in a spread offense at Oregon. So I don't think the system really matters as much as a lot of these scouts think it does. Yeah. I think it's more about your intangibles, your measurables, and... Um, you know, basically your, your overall production. Honestly, I say it like this. You're a good player. You're going to adjust to what's given to you. You're given a playbook on day one in training camp. You go in there, you learn that playbook, then you become a star. Just because you play in a pro style or a spread or a West Coast offense, again, like you said, it doesn't matter. So many guys come in playing different offenses than what they played in college, and they go on to be great quarterbacks. <laughs> That's, that's basically the way I look at it. And But, again, I don't think it's the strongest quarterback draft no. class. I'd be, I wouldn't be surprised if only one, get two, one or two of these guys end up hitting at the next level because it's really kind of a weak class for quarterbacks. But um, the other thing I wanted to point out, let's talk, there's two tight ends on those lists, yeah. which is really interesting. Usually you don't have more than one tight end in the top prospects list, but O.J. Howard is everyone's like consensus best tight end. I actually think David Njoku's better. I think that... You know, pretty much he checks every box. The only things that he's really worse than O.J. Howard on is he's not as fast, he's not as agile, but pretty much everything else, all the other metrics, he's actually better than him. So I think it's a little curious that everyone's like saying O.J. Howard's definitely the best tight end, but, I mean, what's your take on that? Speed plays a part. Speed talks. And in, an offensive, in offenses that are solely built where tight ends are more or less a, a second wide receiver, you know, I mean, look at it for what it is. I mean, you need tight ends to be faster to go against faster linebackers. Linebackers aren't the slow big guys out there anymore. No, these are ex-safeties that are being bulked up to play linebacker now to attack the tight ends, to attack the run better. So, yeah, I may take a speed tight end over, you know, a slower tight end. That, that Honestly, that would tip the balance for me on it. True. I don't think David Njoku is particularly slow. He's, no, not, no, no. he's not as fast, but... The thing about the David Njoku I like is he was more dominant in college. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you look at it from you know the production he accounted for yeah. in his offense compared to what O.J. Howard did against the other players in his offense, yeah. he accounted for more production on that field. And uh, just again, as a guy that checks all the boxes, he's my top tight end. But I like O.J. Howard too. I'm not trying to knock him. I'd be happy if the Ravens picked up either one of these guys, honestly. <laughs> yeah, they'd, they'd be good picks, um, but you'd pay a yeah. steep price for them. Um, You're going to pay a pretty penny. But you mentioned that speed kills, <laughs> mm-hmm. and John Ross, I believe, is on this top yeah. prospect list because he set solely that record. Solely because he dash. set the record. I think solely that record is what set him apart. And, hey, kudos to him. It's a heck of a record to beat. <laughs> yeah, it is. But, again, I kind of suspected this might happen that – what a guy that probably would have been a second round pick yeah. is now going to be a sure first round pick because of this. But I think that goes to I think we had a conversation about it a few weeks ago about how important the draft is, how important these drills are. You know, I mean, on paper, you know, a guy can run as fast as you know John Ross. Yeah, that looks amazing. But does that translate into game speed? 
Because there's a big difference when you have 20 pounds of pads on, you have quarterbacks that are just the same size, you chasing you down, hawking you down for that ball. Does that speed translate into the game? You know? I, there's a lot of stuff to think about. And I always look at the, the combine, and I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, can this guy run this fast? Is he going to be this productive when there are defenders attacking him? When, you know, there's game clock, when plays are being called, and you have to think at the blink of an eye just to, you know, make the play. Well, that's the thing about it is that every year we see, like, freak athletes mm -hmm. that have great measurables from the combine that don't amount to anything. Yeah. And that's why you also have to take into account how did this guy produce in college? You know, when did he break out in college? Like, how like how young was he when he got on the field at his school? Yeah. Like, there's other things you got to take into account when you're assessing these players. John Ross, again, mm -hmm. great, uh, amazing speed, obviously, posting that mm -hmm. record stat. But when I look at this list, and he's ahead of Corey Davis, uh, John Ross, the second best receiver in this class, I mean, I don't think so, because this is a guy that, you know, when he did that 40-yard dash, and I looked into him, I comped him to Deshaun Jackson. I said, like, his best case scenario at the NFL level, he's going to be the next Deshaun Jackson. Yeah. But I think that's his best case. I don't think that's, like, an automatic thing. I think that's, like, his ceiling. And I think that when you look at guys like Corey Davis, he's getting knocked probably because he went to Western Michigan. Yeah. But this is another guy that checks all the boxes. I mean, you can make an argument for Davis being the top receiver prospect. Yeah. I, and I want to say that. And, you know, I'm going to do my BYU plug here. Jamal Williams, who broke the all-school records for rushing, had amazing games in, against Michigan State, you know, over the year. Had a good game against Utah who ran up against some of the best defenses, but yet because he probably went to a BYU, because he didn't have the best, you know, the best combine, he's probably going to get knocked down to a four for a third round pick. Easily, prob most likely probably fourth, unfortunately. But because he's a small school, I think a lot of guys get passed up because of that school. And that's unfortunate because if you watch the gameplay, you would see these small school guys can, came here to ball. Well, and it's a, it's a small school for Division One, yeah. but it's not like he went to Towson. It's exactly. not like he went to Stevenson. <laughs> you know, like he's still a Division One yeah. ball player, and he played. And Corey Davis played against top defenses yeah. and got yeah. hundred yard games. So, like, again, he's he's mm -hmm. either my top receiver or like or like you know neck and neck with Mike Williams. He's mm -hmm. not the third guy in my not opinion. Not the third guy, definitely not. Uh, and I mean, we all know Mike Williams is great. He's an amazing red zone threat. Um, yeah. I actually think he would have been better if he didn't have Deshaun Watson throwing the ball. That's my opinion. in the first round. But I mean, I, I think your hate for Deshaun Watson is too strong. <laughs> that may be, but hey, we're gonna see where this guy ends up and how his career turns out. Yeah. But I think that just about covers it for offense. I understand uh, you wanted to talk about some of the defensive guys, right? Yeah, I did want to cover a couple of the defensive guys, and we'll we can break them down. And we'll go down the list of their rankings. So number one, we have Miles Garrett, defensive end from Texas A&M. And we got Jamal Adams, safety from LSU at number two. Yeah, we also got Jonathan Allen, defensive tackle from Alabama. And we have Solomon Thomas, defensive tackle from Stanford. We have Malik Hooker from Ohio State, safety. Marshawn Lattimore, top cornerback in the draft out of Ohio State. A lot of Ohio State guys. But another Alabama guy, Reuben Foster, inside linebacker for Alabama, who recently failed a drug test. But yeah, so this will be interesting where he drops. <laughs> then we got Derek Barnett, defensive end from Tennessee. Yeah, and then we have Hassan Reddick, inside linebacker from Temple. And Garion Conley, cornerback from Ohio State, rounding out the top ten players. Now, let's be honest here. In the, you know, on ESPN, most draft lists are showing... Number one draft pick goes to Miles. Yeah, right. That's, I, I've seen a lot yeah. of mock drafts where Miles Garrett is the top pick to the Cleveland Browns. Um, but again, on draft day, it's like anything can happen, anything man. Anything can like, happen, like, dude. Like just because uh, all, oh, the, wow. all the media puts this guy as a top yeah. pick, I wouldn't be surprised if the Browns do something crazy and like do Mitch Trubisky first pick or Deshaun Watson first <laughs> pick or... You know, just get a quarterback. Let's like be honest here. They're going to draft a quarterback. You know they are. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if they did. Yeah. I mean... But uh, that does affect the draft in a dramatic way. If Miles Garrett does not go first, where do the rest of the pieces fall? That's what I'm wondering. Well, this is like what happened in a previous draft where, like, Leonard Williams was everyone's, mm -hmm. like, top uh, talent. And he ended up going to the Jets, like... Yeah. 
way further down in the first round than anyone thought he'd slip. So I wouldn't be surprised if something happened like that to yeah. Miles Garrett. I mean, I've been talking to some people on uh, social media that actually were saying that they think Miles Garrett is a bust, and I'm like, well, that's a bold take. He's like the number one prospect. Yeah, but six foot four and a ton of pounds. I don't think he's going to be. Yeah, a I mean, I don't have a problem with really any of these defensive guys. No. If, if anything, maybe like you mentioned, the Reuben Foster failing the drug yeah, test is a problem. Yeah, and honestly, before you know, I found out he failed the drug test. I was like, man, he would be a good fit on the Ravens. You know. Ravens just lost Zach Orr. We could use another guy in the middle to help out, you know, C.J. Mosley. So it's going to be interesting to see where he falls. Maybe Ozzie may, you know, Ozzie, uh, Alabama alum, may seek fond pity on him, pick him up and bring him on. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Well, it seems like what the Ravens have really needed in recent history is, like, a solid corner. Yeah. And so do you think there's any chance they trade up for Marshawn Lattimore or maybe get one of these other corners? I don't think so because of our free agent signing. Um, we also do have Jimmy Smith. I could see us looking for maybe a corner in the second round. I don't think we're going to waste a first-round pick on a corner. It is a need of position, but I think we're going to look more to probably a inside linebacker, maybe someone to you know journey under Terrell Suggs when he decides to retire. I feel like Terrell Suggs only has a year or two left, so we need somebody to replace him within the years. Um, I could see, honestly, when it comes to the Ravens, maybe going the offensive line route, definitely. I mean, and of course, we're talking defense right now, but I could definitely see them going for offensive line route just to build that protection around Joe Flacco. Yeah. Well, the funny thing about that, though, is that like virtually every expert I've seen talking about the draft and the mm-hmm. players that are coming in, they've all seemed to agree that it's a much better draft class for defensive players. Yeah. Like, there's expected to be more defensive players going in the first round than offense. I, and I mean, these are solid guys, and, yeah, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with this draft class for defense. So it's going to be interesting to see where some of these guys end up. I mean, yeah. So I think we covered the top prospects for offense and defense. There was a couple other things I wanted to talk about. I mentioned earlier um, – Joe Mixon, running back mm-hmm. from Oklahoma. And this guy is my most disrespected uh, <laughs> prospect because he's got a third-round grade on him, essentially. Yeah. Everyone's projecting him to go to the third round, it seems. And I've seen, you know, watching those sports channels like ESPN, mm-hmm. NFL um, uh, Network, and things like that, uh, I've seen some analysts say this guy's like the seventh-best running back. And to me, that's such an insult because... I think you can make a case for him being one of the best running backs. Yeah. So, uh, again, I think he gets the knock because of the off-the-field issues. A couple of years ago, he assaulted a woman, and there was a big thing. So, yeah. like, I, I don't have – I can see why that would drop yeah. the draft stock. <laughs> but if you just look at him from a physical, uh, like, talent standpoint and what he did on the field, he's a guy that could have a first-round grade. He's good yeah. in the rushing and receiving game. So I really like that guy. I already talked about David Njoku. Yeah. Um, I also want to give the audience some of my small school sleepers because, as you know, Gerald, guys that actually go to, like, Division two and three schools mm-hmm. rarely pan out at the next yeah. level. It's, it's like finding a diamond in the rough. But there were some guys I detected that might have that upside. One of the guys I like is Krishan Hogan from Marion, and I also like um, uh, Chad Williams from Grambling State. I mean, these are two guys that went to small schools mm-hmm. – but they have the size and they have the production that they might be able to pan out at the yeah. next level. I mean, I, you know, I've seen, I went to a D3 school, so, and I've seen some of the guys in that squad. I mean, some of those guys could definitely have played at the next level. Just because you went to a small school does not discount your athletic abilities. And, you know, I always love seeing small school guys just make it. I, I love it. There is nothing better. Because it's almost like this poetic justice. They've been disrespected in the high school recruiting, or maybe they made a mistake here and or there, and they ended up at a small school, and they think their dreams are over. But no, they busted their asses, and they got here. So I would be excited to see some small school guys really break out. Yeah, and from uh, like a and from like a, a, a draft war room standpoint, mm-hmm. if you're digging this deep and and day three of the draft and looking at these kind of guys. You want to look at guys that check all the boxes because you have to take into account because they're playing for one of those small programs, there's less of a chance they're going to pan out. So you really want to find a guy that checks all the boxes, meaning they were dominant at their college, they played from an early age, like 18, 19, they have all the measurables. 
you know, find a guy that, like, it's hard to find weaknesses in him and then take a chance on him with one yeah. of your late draft picks. I look at it like this. I mean, again, BYU is not a small school in any way, shape, or form, but they're not, of course, like, you know, the SEC. Ziggy Ansa, for example, he is one of the best draft picks probably in recent history when it comes to guys that... Ziggy Ansa came from Africa. You know, he lived in Ghana, and that's where he was born and raised. Came to BYU with the idea of doing basketball, doing track. <laughs> um, Bronco Mendenhall said, no, you're putting pads on, you're playing football. The guy's a first-round draft pick, one of Detroit's best defensive linemen. Only played football in college. Never played high school. Never even thought about playing football in his native country of Ghana. That's how cool it is. That's how cool the NFL is because... No, nobody says you have to play football since you're like eight. <laughs> That's the other thing about like when you're talking about taking flyers yeah. day three of the draft and guys that are undrafted even. Yeah. I mean, we can like take for example the guys that played basketball. Yeah. Didn't play any football. Antonio Gates, mm -hmm. Cameron Meredith. These guys are like panned out at the next level yeah. because since they didn't play football, mm -hmm. they have that much more to grow. Yeah. Like you, they're an unknown commodity because they didn't ha like they can actually yeah. get better because they didn't play before. So like you also have to think about the higher ceiling because of that reason. But yeah. at, uh, at the end of the day, it's the draft. Anything can happen. <laughs> it's the NFL. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. Tom and Brady, a six-round draft pick, is now literally one of the best quarterbacks in NFL history. Anything can happen. And, you know, the Tom Brady story just makes <laughs> me wonder, how many guys were actually really good that never got a shot to play? Exactly. Exactly. So how many guys, you know... Didn't get a shot, but people like Kyle Bowler totally busted, you know? <laughs> exactly. Like, draft capital is a big thing. Like, you, you spend the early pick on a guy. Like, you're going to try to get him involved, even if he sucks. Yeah. <laughs> right. But anyway, that's our draft special. I'm going to be giving live updates during the draft. You know, when a guy gets drafted and I want to talk about him, look out for that on our channel as well. I'll be giving live updates during the draft. Yeah. And you wanted to say something about the BYU players? Yeah, so... Good luck, Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams. Their draft prospects aren't that high. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, really, um, draft day, we're going to be we're gonna be live all day. I mean, we're going to be on Twitter. We're going to be on Periscope. We'll be on the blog. You're going to be doing your face-to-face -face fit. I'll probably be doing it for you. So, I mean, next week is draft. This is just to get you prepared. We're going to be all weekend. <laughs> all weekend, very active. So please, subscribe to our channel. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, you know, check us out on our blog because we're your draft, we're your draft stop, one stop shop. <laughs> Take care. Yes, if I yes, must, right, I so must do this with the utmost dignity of a royal. I think dignity just went out the window. <laughs>